That uh, looks very strange, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, we can still play your move, King C8. Okay, so here the difference is that I've, I've cost you a lot of time to go after this pawn on, a, I've, co I've cost you a, a tempo to go after my rook, and I'm looking at the pawn on b5, and in this case, rook e5, unlike when our knight was on d4, rook e5 is not very effective. You forced me to play f4. So that's the same if we had played instead of, uh, well, instead of king, well, yeah, no, after king c8. Oh, pardon me, so I was so looking after, at knight b1. So after b1, knight b1, after, mm -hmm. well, first of all, what about, so rook e5 immediately. I will you still. You still have knight c3 and. Mm -hmm. Well, after rook e5, knight c3, there is a pin at the moment. So we so, can't, okay. So yeah, be a little bit careful that knight, I've got f4 on my agenda. And I've got knight takes b5 also, um, not compromise, you know, um, taking advantage, thank you, of this pin on the knight. So knight b1 is a crafty retreating move, not, not the move yet. What you want to do, what, what you want, what, how, you play like a girl, activate your pieces. <laughs> Try to get in there, knight d4, knight c6, but exactly. this one actually ends up being the one that uh, but performs the more, most vital function of defending d5. Right, exactly. It's a, it, it has a dual role, attacking the pawn on b5, defending the pawn on d5, and that's key. Maurice has some insights that he'd like to share, I believe. Indeed, on a couple of boards, I'd like to show some interesting developments. In this position, Lenderman, who's our leader, played the move b4. His pawn was already controlling those pawns, and he decided, I don't need that. I want to rip apart that king and create counterplay, rip apart that pawn shield that is around the king. So after b4, king b3, b takes c3, b takes c3, and now he's beginning the perpetual harassment of the white king. He played queen to a8, and we know these are the kinds of positions it's really difficult to promote this pawn because the queen is going to be bothering this king with checks from multiple angles. There's no pawn shield this king will ever find, and this bishop controlling this pawn on this square as well. So it looks as though Lenderman feels this is just a draw. You're not going to beat me in this position. I've got nothing over here, but your king is just too exposed. And he's probably right in that analysis. Another game we want to take a look at is the game between Ramirez and Molnar. And Ramirez in this position, we saw this game. He's already up two solid pawns. And after queen to g4, he just said, I'm going to push queen to f4. Now he played this sequence. Queen check, Molnar went down the board with this move. Anything was losing, but this allows a trade of queens. If uh, Ramirez wants it, he's going to have two pass pawns over here and another one over here. The move king to h3 was played in this position, so he could trade queens or, in fact, just play the move a4 if he chooses to. Uh, another development that I want to get at is uh, the game with Aswaran, uh, this position. Aswaran is still working on this position, trying to get that win, but it's very hard to get out of the shelter right here, and the pieces are frozen on this side. You can't capture this pawn because this pawn would be captured, so it looks as though no progress there. But back to another position, guys. This position, yes, it looks like Zatowski is not figuring out that fortress you discussed, and instead she's brought her bishop over on this square and has weakened her pawn structure just a little bit Looks like black might be making some progress in this position. So lots going on on different boards. People still trying to win some games. This particular one will be huge for the championship in the woman's side because a loss by Zatonsky would just devastate her chances of winning the whole thing. Of course, she still has to face Crush eventually, but this would not be a good way to proceed with the white pieces losing to one of the lower rated players in the field. Back to you guys. Yeah, this h3, bishop d2. Doesn't actually, make a good impression, does it? It's h3 weakening. Right. So making it even harder to make a fortress. Well, one of the things that black needs to do, uh, I always thought they move h5 was very useful. Um, but I think Anna might, in that position, want to play h4 and try to freeze that h pawn from making any further progress. Let me bring that game up on our board because that is actually crucial. Um, before the tournament, I really felt, 
I'm no genius, but I really felt that uh, the the uh, women's championship was going to come down to a two-person race between Irina and Anna, and I always thought that their matchup was going to decide the championship itself. When they do play, do we know uh, who yeah, has the white? Round that yeah, they're it's gonna the, be playing. the and penultimate think, round, but who has the white pieces? I believe that Irina should have them. I'll double check that. Okay, you'll double check that, and we'll just go back and and investigate these last two moves by the players. Uh, Queen D3, as expected. Yes, she does have white. Irina mm -hmm. has white. Okay, that's that's huge. <laughs> King G7, fine. H3, and not a move that I think uh, is very good. And now the move um, H5. This makes it really, really tough on white to decide what is the ideal setup on the. Uh, let me show you why I think that um, um, having this pawn on H3 instead of H2 is wrong. Because after this type of a pawn sacrifice, now this pawn gets to f4, and this is absolutely easily winning suddenly, because your next move is going to be queen e3 check, and um, white can't keep up the blockade. After a move like bishop f3, queen e3 check, king g2, queen e1, and we see uh, a huge difference uh, now with the pawn on f4. Before the pawn was always staying on g3, right? You never had uh, access to the g3 square, but guess what? The blockade can't be kept. So this is and even easier. You don't even need to do the, the, the whole king, king f6 to c2, which yeah. would, even in itself would have been w very was good enough as well. So I, that, that's why I, I that, that, that move h3 sent a shiver up my spine. It does not look good. When you're trying to create a fortress, the idea is that you don't create more weaknesses, that the, the pawns should stay back so that at least the king can defend them. You should write books. <laughs> <laughs> you're absolutely I right. a couple of books. There you go. <laughs> I'm trying to encourage you, Jim. Maurice, what is your take on this? Yes, Yaz, uh, it looks as though there's some serious business going on in the Ray Robson game, not just on the board, but in particular on the clock. We're not surprised, right? Ray's biggest weakness everyone talks about is his love of time pressure. Well, I don't know if he would say he loves time pressure, but he always seems to get into time pressure. And in this game, it's no different. He has only 2 minutes and 53 seconds left on his clock. Of course, with increments, that's kind of a fake number because he gets 30 seconds every time he moves. But nevertheless, he's under a lot of pressure here, and his opponent instead has 27 minutes plus trying to figure out the best moves. Not a great place for him to be, especially with this position where he is worse. He's played the move B3. His rook is very precariously placed on that side of the board uh, after takes, takes, and king to B8. He has to drop his rook back. And by the way, I should point out this fine move that was played by Naroditsky, this F5 move, freezing everything on this side. And now he can just play king to B7. And this rook looks a little bit ridiculous, in fact. Uh, the move a4 can be met by b4, and again, look at this rook. It's caged, defended by this knight, but this rook is free to roam, going down into the position, picking off a pawn, all kinds of dangers here for the white pieces. Add to the fact that he's in time pressure as well. This does not bode well for Ray Robson. So in serious trouble here, if Narodisky can just find a few good moves, he might be well on his way to his first win here in the championships. Guys? Very good, very good. And in the game uh, between, um, <laughs> boy, I always get between her name. Malakina and, and Eswaran. Eswaran, Eswaran. Unfortunately, Esh she, we reached a position where it was a kind of a Zukuswan. Black can't bring her king out and prepare to promote her pawn because after checks, there's just a whole series of checks. So Eswaran was forced to move her rook and played the move rook g3, and uh, white got the exact ending that Maurice was talking about, and after the trade, this h-pawn is going to f f force um, 
black to sacrifice her rook one day, one day, in this variation that I'm showing, and the game will be agreed a draw. Indeed, even if in this one. In many variations, yeah. So, so. this game, uh, will this be, yes, it will be Eswaran's first draw. All of her results to this moment and have Alyssa's been decided, too. and Alyssa's Which as is well. normal in the cha women's championship, though. There's so many decisive games there. You guys are killers, <laughs> <laughs> really. So, it does appear uh, that um, Eswaran's technique, unfortunately, 13 year old inexperience, didn't. Uh, she she did have a winning position, that was for sure, and she just let it slip away. And it goes to show you that you want to try to find those rook end games when you're on the losing side, because Alyssa was able to save herself because By of steering them into, steering into exactly. that game, yeah. All right, very good. And, and so we, have, we still have a lot of games going on today. They are fighting today. Um, we've also got... We've, we've looked at a Ehrenberg Lenderman. That's still mm -hmm. going on. We looked at that recently, though. It looks like Ramirez is going to win. And it looks Naroditsky's like on top. Gadiev uh, also in a rook ending that looks very balanced. Uh, still a little bit of an edge for Akobian, as explained by Maurice. Um, still balanced. Um, one, two, three, three versus three rook ending. The difference here in this rook ending and why I like a Kobian's chances, these doubled A pawns are kind of scraggly. Um, no pass pawn on the A file, that B7 pawns, but conversely, black has an opportunity to, black has a pass pawn, uh, pass C pawn. He has an opportunity to try to advance this pawn and uh, in conjunction with his king, try to win white's rook for the pawn. So that's why I like a Kobian's chances, but because the material is so reduced, uh, I wouldn't, I, I see more drawing chances than winning chances for a Kobian. So this game probably heading for a draw, but advantage for VAR. One game we haven't looked at yet in the women's championship between Two players who you know are always a threat to the leaders, right? Zenyuk and Abrahamian. Yes. Zenyuk, the only player to nick Irina Crash mm -hmm. for a draw so far. The therefore, deny. eliminating the possibility of the Fisher Prize, sixty-four thousand dollars Fisher Prize. Right. Um, and by the way, the last player to get nine zero in the U.S. Women's Championship was Anna Gulko. Yes. That's who it was. I, I was thinking Donaldson, but it was actually right. Gulko. Anna's yes. So our big chess fan Ed, he. Uh, he told me that that was the one. Bo the wife of Boris Gokho, uh, two very, very famous dissidents at the time coming from the Soviet Union, Anna and Boris Go Gokho came to America. And interestingly, having won the Soviet championship, <laughs> kind of winning the, uh, win, uh, the U.S. championship as well. I think that's quite remarkable. That's a good feat, right? Yeah. And this game uh, uh, with Zenyuk, um, also fairly balanced, but I kind of like Black's position somehow here. Even though you have this uh, white, pardon me, has this past B pawn, which could be very f threatening, the reality is once the rook gets behind that B pawn, it really isn't going anywhere. And on the other side of the board, just be careful um, that you don't allow a mating net to be set up with H4, knight G3, rook, uh, coming to H1, and we have a result. Yes, Jen. we do. In our one, our critical game today for the standings, Ehrenberg and Lenderman. We thought this game was steering towards a draw, and they have shook hands. The game is a draw. A hard fought one. I think that Alex will be very pleased with the result. Uh, he mixed it up in the opening, playing something he never played before. Well prepared. Uh, Sergey held an edge, in my opinion but nothing very, very significant and a good, well, in the words of Gada Kamsky, professional draw. And that doesn't hurt Lenderman at all. Uh, he skates by with the black um, and maintains a wonderful plus three record. So four from five for That's Alex right. Lenderman. You know, he did get the worst out of the opening and it looked like Ehrenberg had some chances to push, but mm -hmm. I still admired his choice to play the Sicilian. Yes. But will we see it again? I'm sure we will. Uh, 
w success. <laughs> it's a great feeling, and uh, it was a very successful debut for the but Sicilian. For success, because he had to suffer a little bit. You still think it was a success? I think it was a success because the suffering was rather minimal in my view. Mm -hmm. And especially after G4, H4, I thought that that was not the most, um, that, didn't, that, that didn't allow White to, to get in the best punch. Right. Well, let's see what uh, Lenderman has to say about his chance in the, this game and whether he was pleased with his opening. Or I'd be very curious to know what he felt were those critical moments where the outcome was decided. Exactly, we're getting him set up with Grandmaster Maurice Ashley right now. I would like to give you guys an opportunity, a reminder, that you can tweet us questions and if we can fit them in and ask the guests, we'll do it. So right. hashtag US Chess Champs or comments at stlouischessclub.org. Send your questions in and they're ready. So we've got our tournament leader, Alexander Lenderman, with Maurice Ashley. Thanks, Jen. We are with Grandmaster Alex, uh, Alexander Lenderman. First of all, congratulations on your draw. Or maybe you don't feel that way about it. Are you, are you satisfied with the results you had today? Sure, it was a good battle. You know, I think I did my best, so I was happy. Your opening choice seemed unusual for you. Is this special preparation you had? I'm asking that tongue-in-cheek, of course, because obviously your preparation has been really good. Uh, in this tournament. Why did you choose this variation? Well, concretely for Sergey, I think these sharp positions, I think that they're not, of, uh, they're not in Sergey's flavor. And, uh, you know, it was a concrete analysis. It's a very dangerous position, but uh, me and Georgie, my coach, decided that um, for this one game, it's probably a good option. Interesting how you're varying your openings uh, in the tournament. Uh, it seems like you're really well prepared uh, for this event. Komsky mentioned that he thinks players were preparing maybe for even a month before the event leading up to it. He's never seen such really sterling preparation. Would you agree with him? Uh, for me? For you and the other players in the tournament. Uh, well, uh, sure. I mean, you know, I, I try to, like I said, uh, get better every day. So I always do some general preparation. But for this tournament, I try to play different stuff because uh, I also try to avoid other people's preparation. Did you come into this championship with expectations, uh, you, so far you're really doing very well, uh, leading the tournament by yourself right now. Akamski drew today. It looks like your Gray will will Timur's also oh, okay. draw his game very likely. In fact, his opponent is pressing. Did you come in with any expectations in the tournament, or, or did you expect to be doing this well? Well, uh, I, I try not. To, like first of all, to answer your first question. I, di I didn't really have any expectations. I was just trying to do the best I can and uh, one move at a time, one game at a time, and give it my maximum effort every game. As for expecting to do well, I mean, I'm not surprised that I'm doing well. I feel like uh, I'm, eh, it's, it's always a possibility, but I didn't exactly explicitly think, you know, what result I'll be having. So, because that's just extra distraction. And I still try not to think about results. And against Sh Sam Shanklin, who you have tomorrow, what's your record against him uh, and how do you feel going into the game? I feel pretty confident. My record is not that great against him, but uh, well, actually this is the first white I'm getting in, uh, in. It's the ninth game we're playing long game and it's the first time I'm playing white. Wow, that's incredible. Um, uh, all the other games had black. You know, I had some missed opportunities, but uh, like I said, uh, I, I also had a very bad record against Sir Gerenberg. Uh, so like I said, it's, it's a new tournament new game. I try to put all the other games behind me. You know, I was a different person back then. Like I said, I try to get better every time. So I, I try not to let it get, let it affect me. Indeed. Well, we wish you the best in your future games playing really well right now. Thanks. Grandmaster Alex Lendeman, our tournament leader, really blazing new territory for him and uh, sitting pretty right now in the U.S. Championships. Back to you, Jen and Yaz. Out of high, we didn't find the critical positions, but it seemed to, uh, from the way um, uh, Alex was describing the battle, he really just didn't feel like he had ever had any problems in this game, and it was just a good, well-fought, hard-fought draw. And I think we're going to hear from Sergey as well, but I wanted to bring up Ramirez <coughs> Bolner because he's threatening a, a cute little knight checkmate. Okay. I'd love to put that on the board. All well, right. I guess it's not really a checkmate, but but a big close threat. Enough. Just uh, always pretty to see these 
Checkmates with weak pieces, which we seen, we saw a lot today in uh, Irina's game. So Mac move, in trouble. Queen F2 sets up the threat of the retreating knight move. So we actually made the maneuver queen c5, back to f2. Two. And, and now, now knight g1 is the idea. Now that the pawn on h2 is defended by the queen, knight g1 would uh, win uh, black's queen. By the way, do I, do you see a defense to this move? This move looks really, really strong. You'd have to move the queen out of the way but wherever you move the queen really looks kind of ugly. Um, there's simply a different um, checkmate to be had here. Uh-oh, the, the checkmate I had in mind was to play h3. Um, the queen g2 is pretty good. Yeah, it only wins a piece. I was trying to win a king. <laughs> I was trying to win a king. Uh, but that, that, that's winning, and it looks to me like uh, this nice retreating move. Queen. You have three there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I don't know, know. But I'll just take the piece. But Queen F2 seems to wrap up the game uh, nicely. It's kind of sweet style, because the, these retreating moves, that's not what you expect no. for the final combination, but right. there you go. That's a good one. And Mac. Uh, uh, is about to tumble, I believe, to a second defeat in a row. After playing very solid for, through the first three rounds, uh, that blunder against Garyev, uh, I guess, simply put, he hasn't recovered from it. Right, and a nice win for our runner-up. And we do have uh, Sergey Ehrenberg with us to talk about his draw against the tournament leader. Indeed, Grandmaster Sergey Ehrenberg, who's showing me lines and saying he thinks he was winning. He feels like it was a lost opportunity for himself. Welcome to the show, Sergey. You. Uh, you feel like you had a real chance here that you let slip through your fingers? I felt like this endgame is close to be winning. Um, I might be wrong. Uh, I thought that either b3 or king b3 in this position uh, would lead to a very tough endgame for black. But maybe computer sees some uh, escape. Uh, computer always sees something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, the thing is that if I manage to uh, exchange bishops, it's completely winning position for white because I, uh, my king will approach b5 pawn and uh, I will just take it because and black doesn't have any counterplay. His king is completely passive. Um, I felt like I completely outplayed my opponent, but uh, he defended well and apparently I, I didn't use my chances. Well, <laughs> as always in this tournament. No, he's been playing really well, though, so far. Even when he's worse, he's somehow coming up with moves uh, what do you think that is? Is it just pure form or, or just luck? It's, no, I mean, it's definitely not just luck. And if, if he's lucky, he, he makes, like, he makes uh, maximum out of his chances by fi uh, fighting hard. Um, I mean, yeah, you definitely need uh, some help from op uh, your opponents when you are in trouble, like he was against Gareev or in this game. Um, but yeah, he's having a great tournament and he's uh, his uh, deserved leader. Now you're at minus one right minus now. Minus two, actually. minus two even actually. Yeah. So how do you how do you dig out of this hole? I mean, you're playing good moves, but somehow. I mean, yesterday the I felt moments. like I also I, go, I got really nice position with black pieces against Gata Gatakamski, and just uh, I collapsed completely collapsed at some point. I I don't know how to explain it. Sometimes you know it's not your tournament. Uh, I mean, I'll try to do my best and uh, I'll keep playing uh, the way I do. <laughs> Indeed. I'll keep playing fighting chess and I'll try to win ga subsequent games. Well, we hope you win a few games in the next uh, few rounds. Thanks for joining us and we wish you the best in the rest of the, sh the games. Thank you. Grandmaster Sergey Ehrenberg still kicking himself over yesterday's game and today's game. He's got to clear his mind so he can finish off uh, this tournament strong. Guys? Thank you. Thank you. We, uh, while while you we were on camera there, Maurice, uh, Jen and I are like looking into each other back and forth because of the game with Mac. That's right. We have a funny finish in Ramirez and Mackenzie Moner. Um, if you want to pull that up, yeah, sir. Sure, it's on my screen. Okay, and uh, we were discussing how Night G One seemed impossible to me, and we were also discussing earlier in the broadcast how these two young men are friends, and. Actually, Mulder in this position, apparently, according to the GGT, played bishop to g3, allowing a checkmate in one move. The which, beautiful knight g1. Which you this don't. is not, not the only beautiful checkmate we saw today in the no. championship, right? Beautiful knightmate. But it's there was so, also knight f7. Right, but it's so rare 
that grandmasters actually allow a checkmate to be executed at the board. Usually they'll resign before the checkmate itself right. is executed. It makes you wonder if maybe it was because it was such a cool checkmate. You just want he to did do it. it. <laughs> because, you know, the sure, arena, okay. actually, the, the defending champion, she... She once had this really nice game against Stefanova where she had this beautiful right. checkmate that was a smother maid and mm -hmm. I I was always a little sad that when you look at the end of that game, like her opponent resigns a couple of moves before. Instead of allowing it to be demonstrated exactly. to the audience. Exactly. Yeah. So there is something courteous when your opponent has a really sweet checkmate. Let yeah. them play it out on the board. Mm -hmm. My students also appreciate it. <laughs> okay. And we've got uh, Maurice for that. More on that. Yeah, I think everyone appreciates it. I was thinking about this, wondering for myself, as I th sort of go into the role of a promoter and organizer of chess, how would you incentivize a player to play to checkmate? Because a general audience that we're trying to appeal to really wants to see the finish of the game. They want to see the conclusion. But as chess players, if you're down like a rook or a queen, you're just not going to play uh, more moves simply out of respect, actually, to your opponent. I don't really know what the solution is to that one. I'd love it if some folks out there came up with a, a way to make that possible because it's just, it's just one of those challenges. I've thought of a lot of different innovations, but that one, I'm just clueless. It's like, how do you get players to play to mate or to play out when they're just dead busted? Or maybe just the audience has to just simply assume and understand that it was over and then leave it to us, the commentators, to explain the rest. Seems anticlimactic somehow when we always have to explain it. That, I think, is one minus in our sport that really somehow I don't know how to resolve, but it would be great if we could. I think you can resolve it, um, especially in rapid events. In a classical time control, it might be a little trickier. But uh, when we had the extreme chess championships, which was a 30-minute championship, mm -hmm. we just told the players, play the checkmate every game, and they just did it. It was a rule. It was a rule in the oh, competition. Nice. <laughs> and Do they get paid to do it? Well, they were paid for the tournament, but they weren't paid extra for the checkmate. But they kind of got used to it. It's like, okay, like they start moving quickly towards the end when they're dead lost, and the guy checkmates them. And I'm curious to know if a guy like Gadakomsky would listen to a rule like that. <laughs> I, mean, I suspect he's just going to say, look, this is ridiculous. But that's the thing. They're going to think it's ridiculous in the beginning, but then maybe if it becomes more organizers start doing it, like the Sophia rules, it'll be like, oh, this is a checkmate tournament, and people will get used to it. I, the only thing is in a classical time control, it could be annoying because my vision is if you're dead lost, it's only going to really add three minutes to the game because somebody will just like blitz out queen versus king checkmate, whatever. But the concern is in a classical time control, would it add 20 minutes to the game, 30 minutes? That could be annoying. Yes, indeed, and, and that would drag it on. You basically want to tell them, listen, when you're losing, just lose quick, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's another problem with that. I think it just really is a serious challenge. But as you said, a lot of the rules in chess are established only because they've been there for so long. It doesn't mean that they necessarily belong there, they're, that they're superior to other ways. We've been talking about different ways to handle draws, uh, 30 move rules, and all that. Even clocks, you know, th those rules had to change after the advent of the digital era. So I think any rule can be implemented as long as the players are okay with it so that uh, we can start to try to popularize our sport. We can't live in the past. I think that's definitely a bad place for us to be because uh, th those those ways are just outdated, particularly in this uh, much, much more speedy era. So I agree. We need some, some uh, organizers putting their feet down, like, boom, listen, you got to get mated, son. <laughs> That's going to be a hard one, though, I got to tell you. Mm -hmm. I love that one though, the checkmate championships. You must play to checkmate. Mm. I, I think that's particularly good for things like, uh, I know Maurice is shooting uh, little segments for Fox Sports Midwest. Right. For something small like that so you can sh tell people, this was where it ended. This was the checkmate. Mm -hmm. That's kind of sweet when you're editing it to be able to have that moment of mm. finality. Right. I'm really going to have to give that one more thought because I just don't see uh, the top grandmasters as being amenable. Maybe you could start small in a rapid competition. I'd say where... start with beginners. We start with beginner tournaments and see if they like. They already played a checkmate. Well, <laughs> totally. A of, yeah, a lot of a lot of them do, but uh, then 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 go up and see if elite grandmasters would 
uh, the, nice, the nice thing about a rapid competition is that you know a lot of times when somebody's losing they only have a minute left on the clock anyway so it's like mm -hmm. either play really quickly true and get checkmated or lose on time either one is somewhat dramatic right but uh, but as far as the resignation uh, cause go I mean wouldn't a player just lose on time just like play slower and slower they could do that but I don't think why they want time. to because that would be that would be unsportsmanlike and boring. They'd just be wasting time. <laughs> okay. The only, idea, the only idea I ever came up with uh, regarding this is if there were a bonus for, for or some kind of tie break bonus for how long you lasted in your games. Uh huh. Right. So if at the end you would get some kind of bonus as being the person who played the longest games, mm -hmm. then and and let's say there was money involved. Then players might say, okay, well, then I'm going to play the checkmate, and I'm going to make it really hard for you to checkmate me, in fact, uh, because I want that money bonus at the end. So if you had, let's say, a five grand bonus uh, for the longest games, people are not going to resign just because they lose a, a piece or a pawn or you know, somebody like, let's keep playing because I'm going to drag this out, drag this out, make it hard, because at the end, I'm going to collect five grand in my pocket. I think something like that the players might, might buy into and and uh, especially if you could even raise the money a little bit higher, you know, right? what if it's ten grand, right? They then of course they would money. play on. They get too much money. <laughs> well, they, but they, but, they, but the even so, can, I mean, can collaborate to make really long games. Not really, because it's both players. Well, uh, suppose who, you have a a queen versus king checkmating position. You could deliberately take a little bit longer to checkmate them. That's true. That is true. Yeah, that's what. That's why there's just holes uh, in, in different ideas and. I haven't come up with something that satisfied me yet, but I'm working on it. Trust me. Start I, with rapid. I rapping. definitely want to see mate. I think start with rapping and it's it's painless and see how it goes and people start to get used to it. And we do have an official draw. Um, Iswaran and Melikina was All a draw. Right. Very good. So we expected that. The first draw between those two players. Or uh, the first draw that either of them had for the tournament. That's what I meant. Yes. And I can't wait to hear what the story is with Ramirez Molnar and whether that was a gentlemanly checkmate offer okay or if that was precipitated just a, the whole let's get ourselves <laughs> checkmated discussion or that was actually just a, I'm totally losing and I can't see how to stop my g1 maybe bishop d3 oh wait, <laughs> oh, wait. <laughs> I'm not so happy with how Victoria has uh, handled her uh, queen versus rook and bishop position against Anna it seems to me like Victoria's rather lost the thread a bit I had been suggesting that uh, from this position a long, 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 long time ago that all that Victoria really needed to do was to transfer her queen to the E1 square. And after H5, H3, everything was going well. And then why do I see suddenly this move queen D4 popping up on the screen? Why don't I see the move H5, H4 just making it possible for Victoria to bring her king into the position. So first start, I don't get this, and then after a series of checks that have gone back and forth, we no. do have this position, no. and now I think uh, Anna has excellent drawing chances. Let's just play a move or two so I can at least explain what I think is happening. What I think is happening is that Anna is going to be allowed, given the opportunity, I mean, to trade her g4 pawn for the d2 pawn, and then it's going to be rook and bishop versus queen and pawn, but that's really excellent chances of a draw. So Victoria uh, letting her advantage uh, slip greatly in this game. Yeah, it's shaky indeed, and uh Maurice Ashley, uh, for some thoughts on the Robson Aroditsky game, where is that rook going to escape? No, it's not. It's clear that right now Robson is in trouble and in time trouble as well as he usually is. So in a very difficult position, he played the move rook to a5 and king to b7, and that king is eyeballing that rook, trying to hold it down. The move a4 was played, and the youngster found b4, keeping the rook entombed in the position. The move knight to d2 happened, rook to e1, and now knight to c4 
is on the board uh, looking to somehow take on D6, but this is a very good position after the move. Rook to C1, which has not been played as yet. Robson is in big trouble because if you grab this pawn with check, king up, attacking your rook, and you can't come back with check because guess what? Bam! That's why the rook's there, and suddenly the rook's gone, and that's it. Lights out. Push does nothing at all because of the move knight to e6. This pawn is controlled. This pawn is passed, and white's in deep trouble. White's dead here. So it looks as though Robson is going to go down in flames in this endgame. He has real trouble after this move. If Naroditsky finds it, the move rook to c1, defending this pawn at a distance. So the youngster, that is Naroditsky, the youngest player in the competition, looks like he's about to beat his elder by a little ways. And he has, in fact, played the move. And it looks like we're in the line. And it's just temporary after knight takes d6, if I may show the moves. Knight takes d6, king b6. Uh, it looks like he's played knight to b7 in order to temporarily save the rook. Uh, that doesn't look like it's going to help at all. That looks like bust city. So Robson about to lose yet another game here in the championships. Back to you guys. Wow, big, big turnaround because Ray was uh, chasing the phantom of an advantage. He got his rook deep into the opponent's territory, but unfortunately, it looks like he's lost his, he's going to lose it. He's going to lose a piece, <clears throat> yeah. Well, I think, he's, I think he's going to lose a rook. After knight b7, king takes b7, d6, right? Uh, have I got this situation right? Um, oh, I'm sorry. I'm not able to. There's a rook b. I thought he was going to you lose the rook. You thought b6, but now rook e5. Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, d7, yeah. knight e6, and I still got this rook check on b5. So knight b7 was the best resource in the position, but it's really hard for me to believe that with the extra piece, uh, Danya shouldn't just rope it. Uh, in the point. So let's say after d6, we're going to have to move our knight. Yeah? And at some point, we're going to get some position that looks a little bit like this. But that's an extra piece. And that's all she wrote. So Naroditsky looking really good to win his first game of the U.S. Championships. And we have We'll get that uh, checkmating discussion. Yeah, we need to find uh, out whether that was a gentlemanly checkmate offer. That's our theory. Or uh, just a little bit of a, a brain thing. Brain uh, spasm. Brain spasm. <laughs> of course he was lost. Uh, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? So Grandmaster Alejandro Ramirez with Maurice Ashley. Indeed, with uh, last year's runner-up, Grandmaster Ramirez, welcome to the show. So tell us. We need to know. Bishop G3 happens on the board. A Grandmaster allows knight g1, mate in one. Was it because he's your friend? You wanted the audience to, to uh, get a pretty picture? W what's the reasoning here? Well, I mean, of course he's my friend, but I think sometimes when you are losing in a position, you try to hope for the best, and you forget some variations because you're not double checking because, okay, whatever happens, happens, you're already lost. And in this case, I think, okay, bishop g3 is probably the only try that doesn't lose instantly, unless you forget that knight g1 is checkmate. <laughs> unless it does lose instantly. <laughs> unless it does lose instantly. So I guess he just kind of forgot, because I hovered over the knight and he resigned with a smile. I think he just kind of forgot that it was checkmate. I mean, of course, he's lost anyways. I guess that makes sense, then, that he didn't do it in a gentleman's fashion. Otherwise, he would have actually let you play knight g1, mate. So Right, probably. I mean, whatever. I don't think it's a big difference. But yeah, I think he just forgot about the checkmate. Indeed. We had a smothered mate on another board could have happened. Uh, it's rare that you get this one in actual practice, especially with a black king on h3. That's uh, a new one. You know, it was, it was actually quite interesting because it seems like black was creating a lot of counterplay, bringing in the king and the queen, and it seems like my king was a little weak. And the h-pawn, if it fell, okay, he got a pass pawn. But somehow or another, he was actually not threatening anything. So I could just advance my pawns. And, you know, he quite cre tried to create a lot of counterplay, but the king just ended up being, I mean, checkmated, I guess. Yeah, in that, indeed. It's funny because your pawns haven't gone very far down the board. <laughs> but just him trying to fight back, suddenly it's bait. Yeah. <laughs> Which is kind of funny uh, that you think these pawns would at least be more of a threat before all that happened. Well, they, they kind of are because, I mean, they are, I think, one move away 
from me being able to trade queens and sacrifice my knight without uh, needing it for the advance of the pawns. They can, they can just uh, overwhelm the bishop. But so for that reason, he's in a little bit of a hurry. And on top of that, he actually doesn't have any constructive plan because bishop f4 was the only thing that looked reasonable trying to attack th2 pawn. But that lost to queen f2. And had he done anything else, it wouldn't have been constructive to his position. I can still just advance my pawn. Indeed, you sacrificed uh, an exchange early in this game. Uh, if you don't mind just showing that moment when, when he played bishop h3 on move 11. Would I click on this? Uh, yeah, just click on the, the screen right there. Yeah. You sacrificed an exchange by taking on e5. Did you feel like this was going to be super promising for you? Um, I mean, I thought at first that he was doing something quite bad because I thought, okay, knight takes e5, bishop takes f1, knight takes c6. He cannot take on. Right, we saw this line. We actually. Right, he, can, it. he cannot actually take on f1 first. Right, because you just take because and then take, take the and bishop. I take the bishop. So I thought, okay, he's doing something quite bad. And then I realized, okay, he's going to play bishop f6 first. But the more I looked at it, I was like, okay, knight takes c6, uh, queen d7 is, looks like the only move. And I, of course, knight a5 is the only move. And I thought, in this position, if I somehow was able to consolidate, I would be strategically better because, okay, his rooks are not particularly powerful if the knights can blockade. The only issue was, of course, if I could get my knights back, on, back in time because uh, he, I was, uh, he was playing really annoying moves, like bishop takes f1, of course, queen takes f1. In, he played rook b8, which is one of the many annoying ideas he had. And I wanted to just play knight c4, but I think the computer agrees with me that it's not a, such a great move. Knight c4, bishop takes c3. Pawn takes c3, and then after knight d5, he wants to quickly exchange the knight Let's on. Let's show that uh, yeah. for the fans. Let me just get rid of this. And if you don't mind, just pressing yeah. the variation. So he'll take on c3, take on c3, knight d5. And now his idea is that if I defend the pawn, he can very quickly go uh, knight b6 and c4. It doesn't matter how I defend the pawn on c3. And then knight b6, c4. And then this at least would equalize, because suddenly I don't have a strong knight, and then what my, comp uh, my compensation for the rook. OK, I still have two pawns, but um, you know, suddenly his activity might overwhelm me. And I played something which I'm sure the computer doesn't like, but the computers are quite bad in this type of positions, where it seems like one side has a lot of initiative, but it's not so clear how to make progress. I actually think knight d1 was the best winning try. Because at this point, if I'm able to actually consolidate my position, I'll be in a very good situation. And it's not so clear how he's going to disrupt me from doing it, because it's very clear what I want to do. I want to play knight c4, bishop somewhere e3 or f4, rook c1, b3, rook c2. And once I get all this, he's strategically lost. Now, of course, the computer says some random stuff. But unless it can show uh, convincingly that he can prevent me from developing, I think white is a little bit better. So you seem like you had a real sense of what to do in this position. Feeling good, no doubt. You're back on 50%, is it? Back on even? Yeah, I'm back on even, which is good. I mean, I played quite badly against Landerman, and uh, I feel like, OK, 50% is acceptable. I've had one more white than black. So it's not ideal, but OK, at least I'm not doing badly in the tournament. Indeed. So who do you play tomorrow, and what do you think about your chances there? Um, I'm not sure. I think I'm playing a Kobian because I'm following Garayev normally, but I'm not entirely positive on that. If it's a Kovian, okay, he's always annoying to play against because his prep is quite good and always very solid. Mm -hmm. And he had just beat Garev, so he'll be... I mean, I think he's going to beat Garev in that endgame. Yeah, I think so. He, I, I thought he, Garev was completely lost. Yeah, he oh, already... Oh, when did this happen? Guys, we missed this development. Yeah. Wow. Big development in the championship. That gives yeah. uh, Lenderman a uh, sweet situation to be in. What is he, one full point ahead? Yes. Yeah, yeah. of course, Garev made some strange decisions in this game. He actually had a nice advantage from the opening when he played. Mm -hmm. I think in this position, knight f3 was quite nice because you cannot take on g2. This was a ridiculous move, it turns out, because he actually played queen g5 on purpose. Yeah, uh, he, he completely forgot that queen g2, you can play king e2. <laughs> That's incredible that he played this move, <laughs> and now he ended up winning the game. Shows that one bad move does the game make. Yeah, that chess is funny like that. And then at some point, Gareev allowed this awful rook endgame, which should still be maybe drawn with precise play, but somehow he lost it very quickly. Yeah, we'll let Yaz uh, take us through those niceties. Mm -hmm. But thanks so much for joining us, and good luck in the rest no, of the tournament. No, thank you. <laughs> Grandmaster Alejandro Ramirez uh, winning a fine game and uh, looking to start winning some more games here in these championships. Back to you guys. Nice game, and uh, good understanding by Alejandro. I really like... 
uh, the way he described what he was trying to do, keep as many pieces on the, pe on the board as possible after he had deliberately sacrificed exchange for two pawns. And we do have <coughs> lots of results coming in. As uh, mentioned sure on the is. air, uh, Graev has lost a version of Kobe, and so you're writing off a Kobe cool. as having an all-draw tournament. And he has proven us wrong. Not only is he not got 11 draws, he He's won the game that we thought we'd already written off for him. Well, he was definitely worse out of the opening, but he did fight back, and something went enormously wrong. He started pushing that seat for uh, uh, Gariev. I guess the position was here when things really started getting confusing. Why would you take with the rook and not the pawn? A4. And now g3, that sure looks like a waste of time to me. What I would try to do if I were white is to trade this pawn. I would probably play something, maybe it's too slow, I'm not sure. Something of this nature, uh, trying to get this, uh, how am I going to trade so the pawn? So you were pawn? trying to play like rook b6 and a6? Yeah, right, and that just seems like maybe it's just simply too slow, I'm not sure. Because Ruby's again, the, the pawn is running fast, yeah. But at least if I could, okay, I can maybe force this, but what I'm saying is I was trying, okay, obviously in a, <laughs> this almost reminds me of Eswaran's game, that as soon as white could take this pawn, then he should make a, a draw with a g4 pawn. So, I mean, if I was in white shoes, I would be trying to trade off the a5 pawn for the b7 pawn, right? Well, let's compare that to the game, because the game was kind of similar to that. Well, except what happened in the game, however, was that uh, white really did nothing, g3, and simply allowed black to keep pushing his pawn down the board, and with both, pardon me, not both, but allowing black to keep uh, a pawn of his own meant that, well, I think that this was the resign, the, the move that uh, um, Gariev probably resigned from something like king c3, g5, and the whole point here is that as we get to some situation like this, sure, that's why you wanted to trade those pawns, because you were envisioning the scenario where it would be a draw. Exactly. Because the B and the A pawns would be off, and Verushnikov is smiling. <laughs> he, he, he smiles a lot. So well, what's the difference between a draw smile or just a regular smile and a smile after you win a game? We're about to find out. Trust me, Jen. It's, <laughs> it, it's probably has to do with depths and size. You know, yeah, like, there are studies uh, on this. There right. are, they're really big studies. But VAR will be very proud of his move queen g5, I'm sure. <laughs> and he will be like to explain Sarcasm. his, his deep, deep insight well, that, to the position. Well, I think this is really inspiring for people at home because he made a mistake, which at his level is kind of similar to what a lot of Everybody people watching experience. at home you make play, bigger mistakes. They might even hang a piece. You play a chess, point. you're going to make a mistake. That's full stop. Exactly. Just deal with it. But just, exa and that's what he did. And that's what he so did. So very impressive. And uh, Barujan, also a fan of many people here in St. Louis, is he is the cast, uh, he's one of the major cast members of the rotating crew of Grandmasters that comes in to give lessons and lectures. And you can follow a lot of those on YouTube. And with no further ado, here he is with Maurice Ashley about his first win here at the U.S. Championship. Indeed. Thanks, Jen. We're with uh, Grandmaster Virujan Akobian. Welcome to the show. Thanks. So we had a funny moment in the beginning. We saw this move, queen to g5, attacking the pawn. And uh, we all wondered what you were going to do after knight to f3 since you were losing a queen. Uh, what, what did it feel like when you realized, oops, I can't take that pawn? Um, yeah, I just um, uh, I was expecting him to play knight f3 first instead of bishop d3 to prevent queen g5. But when he played bishop d3, I played kind of quickly. And I missed that uh, when he placed knight f3, queen g2, I missed to move king e2. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly the queen is trapped. Uh, so I had to go back to f6. I basically lost the tempo. And, and what were you thinking to yourself? Were you kicking uh, yourself? Yeah. Did you feel like, what the heck did I just do? Yeah, I mean, uh, to be honest, if I don't play queen g5, I've already equalized the game. I should just play queen f6 and then knight b6 and bishop f5. As soon as I can exchange the light square, bishops should be equal. So I thought, okay, you know, I'm slightly worse now, but I still have to fight. So it wasn't that bad. 
Now, the game did proceed in a way where he looked like he was hunting you down, like knight b6, e4, and then he caught your king in the middle of the board. How did you feel when this move happened? He played very strong, I thought, you know, because in fact, uh, uh, the move g6, I'm not sure if that's the best move because I had two options there. I could play bishop e6 or even h6, but g6 felt like kind of safe. I mean, uh, clearly he's better here. But I didn't see any concrete ways for him to break through. I think he's, you know, slightly better, maybe a little bit more, but I'm, I'm still solid. Now, once you got to time control, it looked like, I mean, you were worse. You were down a pawn for a, a, a hot minute, and then you got a chance to t clean up the queen side pawns. Uh, if you don't mind showing move around move 40 uh, uh, there. I think the turning point here is actually here where he played the move king h2, because I think uh, king h2 is an inaccuracy because it leaves the f2 pawn hanging because my knight is coming on d3. Here I'm down a pawn, but I actually have some cont uh, counterplay here because my knight is uh, very active, knight e5, knight d3. So I'm slightly worse here, but uh, here we were both kind of long time. Were I, you surprised I, when he took on? Yeah, when he took, I think it's just a bad move because, you know, he's up two pounds, but I will just win one of these pounds and it, I will just have a lot of counterplay. I think uh, that might be an inaccuracy. And here, uh, yeah, I took the pawn on f2 because it's important to take the healthy pawn and then try to win the, <laughs> the, the weak pawn. Yeah, right. so, so I took. I think here I'm already uh, absolutely fine. I thought I was slightly better here, actually. Were you thinking win now, or were you thinking uh, just uh, just get that draw? At this point, I'm trying to make the time control. <laughs> so I, was, right. I didn't have that much time. So we played a few more moves here. Now you jumped really quickly after uh, several moves, bringing your rook up, taking the pawn. Uh, defending, and I think right around here. Yeah, if you go back a second, I thought King G5 was very interesting here for him. This move, King G5. Uh -huh. I was a bit uh, worried about it because you know King is active, and then he plays Knight to F4. So I, I think I'm safe after Knight E4. But I thought this was a better alternative a for him. Of fear there. So. Now we didn't see the the end of the game, so please take us through this ending because it looked like to all rights he should be drawing uh, here. You, you traded off pieces and and got to this rook ending. Uh, well, you look like you're slightly better. You play this interesting move, rook to h7. Yeah, because um, I was thinking about rook e5, but then it should be a draw because he wins the pawn on b7. So I want to put the rook on h7, protect my h5 pawn, which is very important, and then try to push the c pawn very quickly. I think this is still a draw, but he needs to play precisely, and he just uh, uh, made, I think, a few mistakes in the so next few tell, moves. So tell us where his mistakes were. He, played, he started with a4, yeah, decentralized your I, I king. I think this king e5 move is a very strong move because I was expecting to play um, you know, c5 first, but if I play c5, he has a6. Mm. And then if I capture, he has rook f6 check. So that's why um, king e5 is very important uh, to prevent that because I need to keep the b7 pawn here. Right. That because way, without this, the b7 pawn, important. it's a draw. Okay. So that's why I need to keep the pawn. And I think... Here, I think the final mistake was, uh, yeah, I think here it's just lost. As soon as I put the rook on C, maybe he missed rook C7. Mm. Maybe he thought I would just go rook H8, but rook C7 is just lost because C pawn is very quick. Even though he wins the pawn, I just push. And you always want to have the rook behind the pass pawn. So here it's just uh, lost because I will win his rook and then collect the pawns. And An amazing uh, turn of events. Great defense on your part after a mistake. You know, there was a joke that maybe you were trying to draw your way to the half Fisher Prize, mm -hmm. but it looks like you didn't have that on your mind. So you, you finally got a win. Good, yeah. good score, to be sure, uh, at plus one in the championships. Uh, and you've, you've kind of turned his tide back a little bit. You're the number four player in the tournament. What are you thinking about moving from uh, this position? Um, I'm just, uh, you know, I'm glad to win a game because, you know, to be honest, the first few rounds was frustrating and, you know, I wasn't getting anything with white and I'm really happy to win a game with black and, uh, you know, I'm looking forward for the rest of the tournament. So I just uh, need to continue fight the way I played today, even though I made a mistake in opening, but I think the rest of the game I kind of played well and uh, fought back my Indeed. way out. Indeed. Real fighter today. Congratulations and we wish you the best in the rest of the tournament. Thank you. Grandmaster Varuja Nakobian, after a fighting win, uh, number four player in the tournament, no one should ignore his possibility of maybe winning the championship. Back to you, Jenny Yaz. Very exciting turnaround, and uh, we do have all of our results in oh, for the wow. championship. Okay. In the women's championship, Zatansky um, was able to hold that fortress against Knee, as you pointed out, some mistakes there on both sides under the pressure, but a really instructive endgame. Definitely. So if you weren't there to hear about all of Yasser's thoughts on that, I encourage you rewind the tape. Are they archived? Yes, they, they are archived. Wonderful. And, and uh, the other game which is finished is Naroditsky.
or Danya, as you call him, Danya. has won his first game of the event. Yay. Sorry, <laughs> Sorry to Ray, but uh, bravo, Danya. That was uh, also another turnaround. Big result, though, that win by uh, Akobian. Uh, heavyweight matchup. Uh, we saw it already. Uh, Garyev uh, Kamsky, and that was such a short draw that it really left a sour taste in our mouths. But this game today was a great fight, and winning with Black is a super bonus. Um, now, um, we've got a couple Lenderman, more interviews set up for you before we close the day. But as you were saying, Lenderman, yeah, Lenderman looking a, good, a, a clear point, uh, a point clear of the field, uh, being chased by. Uh, well, a lot of very strong players. A lot say. of good players, yeah. yeah. Big chases on in the U.S. Championship. And we talked about a player who looked like they were worse and then ended up actually winning the game. We also have a player who, in the Women's Championship, looked like she was going down and she saved the draw. Right. So today is all about saving yourself from worse positions. If the top players in the country can do it, then you guys at home should never give up. We have Alyssa Melikina with Maurice Ashley. Indeed, FM Alyssa Melikina. Alyssa, you look gone. You look dead. How, how, did, how did you feel in this position right here, and how did you come back to be able to draw this game? Yeah, I felt like my only chance was if she simplified early into an endgame and I could somehow win back the D3 pawn. And that's essentially what ended up happening. I thought that after all the captures on D3, she should have just kept the tension, went somewhere like Rook C8, because it's so difficult for me to maneuver. Um, but she probably thought that an end game would be a simpler win. But as we know, with, with Rook endings, draws are always in the air. Indeed. We had a conversation, I believe it was yesterday, where you said it seems like for you the difficulty is converting good positions, is, is your technique. What do you think? Is, is, did she fall into the kind of trap that you've fallen into in the past? Yeah, ab absolutely. Yeah, it, it looks like she just made you know, second best moves and eventually the advantage fizzled out. Now, how are you feeling, though, at this moment? Well, I mean, this had to be just, you, you, I mean, she's all over you in this position. Did you, did you think that you did have a chance, or were you just, just making moves just because? Yeah, it was important for me in this position to realign my thinking because I started out white, Grand Prix attack, first time I'm playing that opening, you know, very aggressive. And here I have to realize that, okay, now I'm fighting for a draw. So I th think it's important to change your mindset here and, and start thinking about how do I make it difficult for her to convert the advantage. That's kind of hard to do though, right? When you're, when you're first thinking attack, win, and now it's completely different, it's save the draw. Yeah, I mean, it, it's not simple, but it, it had to be done here. And you know, thankfully in, in the end game, I managed to pull off a draw with a mismatch. So how are you feeling going into the next game? Um, you know, I'm, I'm definitely not that proud of this game, but I was able to fight on, and that's important for me, and I will bring fighting chess tomorrow. Great. Well, good uh, save, and uh, we wish you the best in the rest of your games. Thanks. FM Alyssa Melahina, survival. <laughs> you got to survive. Gloria Gaynor, I will survive, right? That's the theme here at the championships. Back to you guys. An old expression of Grandmaster Larry Evans, where there's life, there's hope. <laughs> and uh, that was a hopeful save uh, by Elisa today. But she had a plan for saving. She, was, she, she, she really had, like, this is my plan. Mm -hmm. This is my one hope. And, and try that's to, important. Try to get, take her into rook ending, where maybe she has more experience than her opponent. Yeah, try to keep your confidence <clears throat> up and don't give up. Even Nicobian, you know, it's funny how the top players are just so confident because we thought his position was really bad. He was like, yeah, it was a little worse. Yeah. He, and of course, I, I think objectively the truth is somewhere in between. But right. I think that right. feeling that you're only a little worse keeps him super attentive and not too hard on himself. Yeah, he, he I believe he overestimated his position. I thought he was a lot worse. I I was really surprised that he kind of came in and said, you know, like, I defended, I defended, and now it's my turn to, to win, you know. like. But in any case, very impressive. You don't beat Timur Garyev uh, very easily, and to, to beat him from a worse position, well, wow, that's a real success. And another big winner today, who we thought was in trouble at some point, Daniel Naroditsky with his first victory of this event. He's with Maurice Ashley. Yes, I'm with the youngest competitor on the male side in the competition, Grandmaster Daniel Noroditsky. Congratulations on your win. Thank you. First, tell us about this finish. Clearly, you're completely winning, and your opponent in this position played rook to e5 
Check. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, after f takes e5, it's close to stalemate. But uh, of course, yes, king takes e5. It was just <laughs> indeed kind of he a... can he can take your pawn. <laughs> Unfortunately for him, if we could just change the rules around a little bit, guys. Uh, he could have had a beautiful stalemate. Yeah. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, no. You were in trouble. It looked like in the beginning, or at least he played this very interesting novelty yeah, never seen against your Berlin. I mean, that. What did you think when you saw that? Well, of course, I don't usually play the Berlin. I, I just my goal is to get Ray into more of a sort of positional quiet uh, ending. Uh, of course, he's known for his very dangerous opening preparation. And uh, you know, I know Bishop G5 and Bishop takes C6 is the main move. D takes C5, but I've never seen Bishop A4. It was an unbelievable idea, and it's you know technically I guess it's pretty logical because my knight on d6 uh, blocks the center. Show us but, that uh, position if you don't mind. Just just uh, press right at the moment. Um, um, there, so knight d6, and he played bishop a4, and I don't know if it was ever played. Um, yeah, we didn't we didn't uh, find this move. We we're going to have to do our research, but. This line led to a, a straight loss of a pawn, and he still looked like he had very good compensation. Yeah, the knight on d6 was sort of the bane of my existence, and I, I calculated a lot of lines, and I figured uh, I, I'd settle for a slightly worse but extremely solid position after bishop g5. So when the position started turning a little bit, when, when did you start thinking, I can win this game? Uh, that's a good question. I think, uh, I think it was the ending, because, um, well... I thought the ending was just about even. Maybe he had a very slight pull. But when he played, uh, I think rook a7, was it? It was somewhere here. Uh, knight b3. No, this was, it was earlier. Yeah, rook a here. When he played 37, rook a6, um, perhaps it is objectively the best move. But he was in very acute time trouble. And obviously, the rook is very close to being trapped. So I figured that um, even though he's, uh, he's an amazing tactician and uh, a great calculator, uh, it, it would still be difficult to um, to save the rook. I mean, it's easy to err in this position. Yeah, rook trapped rook is a trapped yeah, rook. Yeah, and <laughs> my play is significantly um, more straightforward. Indeed. I don't really have that many choices. So, indeed, a fine win in the end, trapping that rook. Uh, this is your first win in the championship. First win. Uh, it's got to feel pretty good. What are you thinking going forward? Yeah, I mean, it feels great. Um, it's good to sort of I don't know break the ice somehow. Um, of course, there is some degree of luck involved. Uh, but I thought, you know, I played well throughout, uh, sort of didn't really make any mistakes, just kept solid, and uh, I was rewarded for it. So, yeah, I'm really happy, and uh, hopefully I can continue the trend. We hope so, too. So good luck in the rest of the championship. Thank you very much. Grandmaster Daniel Naroditsky. I love when these players talk about luck, like they don't make good moves. <laughs> Back to you, Jen and Yaz. And that's all for today. We've got all of our results in. Let me go over quickly through the standings. Cause right. Now there are a lot of players chasing Lenderman, as you pointed out, some pretty strong players. Mm -hmm. We've got Lenderman with four points, a point ahead of the field. But look who's behind him, Graham, even though he lost the game. Kansky, Onashuk, and Akobian. Quite a wolf so pack. Uh, kind of like the <laughs> Olympic team chasing after it. <laughs> right, right. I was going to say the wolf pack, but yeah, that's that. Well, if he wins a tournament, he'll be with those players at the Olympia. So. Oh, good point, by the way. Uh, the winner it, it does, in fact, qualify for the U.S. team. So, and can in, Lenderman keep up the pace? And in the ladies? And in the ladies, we have Irina Crush, and she's only ahead by half a point because Atansky did save. Wow. So, so that's still setting up Hansky there. Just half a point behind. The, so that still sets up for a winner-take-all kind of match in the penultimate uh, round eight and for the ladies. That's right, and we have some final words from Maurice. Indeed, we have five rounds uh, under our belts on the men's side and four on the women's side. Tomorrow the women go to play their midpoint game, right, the fifth game of the championship. So sitting pretty certainly has got to be Irina Crush. She is just playing some wonderful chess today, was one that she will put in her best games book far off into the future, I'm sure. But she'll remember this one for quite some time. Anna Zatonsky, though, remember that first round game she had against Irina Zenyuk where she had to fight to survive? That's what her theme is. She puts up such resistance. She knows she needs to stay well within reach of her main rival. We also have to say the 13-year-old has got to feel a little bit disappointed as Shrita Esmeron not winning a dominant position, but hopefully she can clear her head and keep playing uh, moving forward. On the men's side, Lenderman, I'm just totally impressed. But yeah, as you called it, the Wolf Pack, the Olympic team, a bunch of gangsters are chasing him right now. He has to really keep his preparation together and tight. 
and see whether or not he can keep this lead going into the future round. So it's a really exciting part of the championships. Well, we hope that you will stay tuned for every minute of it. We will be back tomorrow at the usual time. So whether you're here in St. Louis or you're watching from home, join us tomorrow at 1 Central, 2 Eastern for round six of the U.S. Championship and round five of the U.S. Women's Championship. This is Jennifer Shahadi, and I'm signing off for Grandmasters Yasser Sarwan and Maurice Ashley.